New Buddha Way Dhamma Talks. Jeff Hunt presents a talk on some aspect of the Buddha's teaching. Good morning, everyone. Today's talk is going to be um, roughly on interdependence. It's a very big word, but becoming quite fashionable and is used more in uh, Mahayana uh, areas than in, in uh, Theravada, but it's an important subject. Um, first of all, what do we mean by interdependence? Well, it speaks for itself, doesn't it? Dependence is a reliance uh, on someone or something where A supports B, uh, B supports C, uh, now it starts becoming interdependent, so A supports B, B supports A, and you can imagine this spreading out as a network of conditions where each is dependent on the other, which means that everything is connected. So this could apply generally. So first of all, I'd like to talk about it as a general principle in just making sense of our surroundings, our relationships, um, what's going on with the environment, et cetera, et cetera. All of it, we can, we can bottle it uh, as uh, all is interconnected and all things are interdependent. Now, of course, at first that sounds like a little bit of an exaggeration because things are not all immediately uh, connected or dependent, but sooner or later they will be in some subtle way. I think you may have heard of the uh, metaphor of the butterfly's wing flapping in somewhere in the Amazonian jungle which sets off um, a little spiral of air around the butterfly, which then alters the air around, gradually around the forest, which could change things globally. Well, I think it's a nice little um, metaphor to imagine what's going on, but of course it's uh, more complicated and more subtle than that. But the real point of it is to break out of a certain bondage we have to the independence of things. So. We tend to conceive of um, the universe, if you like, or human life, if you like, as being a kind of a, a bottle or a can of separate things which keep bumping into each other. Well, we really need to let go of that. It's, things are just not that way. Everything is connected in a kind of a flow. And you or me are embedded in that. We are part of that flow. So it's rather like looking at a river of lots and lots of waves and that little wave there is you. And it springs up, it rises under certain conditions, supporting conditions, and then it gradually falls away again. But what hasn't fallen away is the river. It's still going on. So in that sense, we all go on. We just need to let go of our attachment to I, me, mine. And then we become, we get to see that we are embedded in everything and the motion of everything. So um, the opposite of interdependence, I suppose, would be independence. So at the moment, we are very wedded to the idea of independence. I am independent. We know we, we, we talk in this way. We think in this way. So we think of our, our individual rights and uh, so on. Um, it actually goes back a couple of thousand years or more, not just to Buddhism, but to Western philosophers like Heraclitus, who used to say that everything is flowing. Or in China, Lao Tzu used to say something very similar. So people with uh, great wisdom and depth of thought, they see that everything is flowing into everything else. And despite appearances, we are not actually separate independent entities. We appear that way and to some extent that is a workable, a workable way of looking at things. However, given our total failure with the environment, our total failure with uh, economic life, our total failure to keep ourselves healthy, our total failure in practically just about everything including war and nuclear weapons, Something is wrong with our way of looking at reality. And breaking, one way of breaking out of this is to see the interconnection of all things. 
and that you are not a separate thing out there. You're not a pea in a pod. You are a wave on the ocean, which is fine. I'd rather be a wave on the ocean than a pea in a pod. Okay, so this is what generally speaking we talk or talk when we talk of interdependence. That is a sort of vision of things that we are seeing. And we can apply it generally to almost anything, for example, to our personal relationships uh, or, to, or to our connection with our consumption of various products. So it does work as, an inter, as, as a general principle. And I think you'll see it throws a, light, a lot of light on a lot of the problems that we got, that a lot of our problems come down to a misunderstanding of our reality. Now, that's a very big claim. But increasingly, all kinds of people in different um, disciplines are beginning to think in that way. So the slogan here, if we need a slogan, is everything is connected. It also means that whatever you do counts. Now that is important. There is no one here that is unimportant. When people are rejected by society, or look down upon, then they can easily remind us of their connectedness through violence. Because that is also a form of interconnection. The interconnection and independence isn't necessarily a good thing. It can be harmful or it can be helpful. But it's important to remember that everything you say and do does count. It makes a difference to things somewhere in that ocean of waves. When we're thinking of harmful, well, I can give you an easy example of harmful interdependence, and that is the global capitalist high finance system that we have. It is an interdependent system. Unfortunately, it's a dysfunctional one. So it ultimately will destroy itself, which is the, the, the phase that we, I, I'm quite convinced, the phase we are now going into is the collapse of that harmful interdependent system. Of course, uh, interdependence can also be a good thing. So when we have communities, when we see families getting together again, it's interdependence, a recognition of interdependence, and that we're really at our best when we support each other, and turn to each other for help and respect each other, things are just so much more meaningful for us. So interdependence, be careful how you use that word. Not all interdependence is, is, uh, is good. You have to think. For the Buddha, one check on things always in the moral realm is, is this harmful or is this helpful? Okay, well, uh, an example of helpful interdependence would be, besides what I've mentioned, families, communities, but also growing communities like this one. Go to the community, we are together, we tend to see each other, we know each other, and now connections are being made between different people. They don't need to come through me. You know, I've never claimed to be any kind of guru or anything. I'm, I'm just, a, just, I just talk really in order to help you to see for yourself that we need a change of reality. So um, if we think of the work done by NGOs, there are probably thousands of NGOs around the world, all doing good things. All of them very different in some ways, but all united in one thing, doing good things for human beings. So just to give you an example, I support Sight Savers, which is to bring a sight mainly to children who are blind due to some simple parasites and diseases that they have. It's a wonderful thing that for just, just for five pounds, you can actually bring sight to someone. But then it needs, in this day and age, it needs to be organized. I can do it for one person, but NGOs are interdependent groupings doing good. If you're on the outside, please join on the inside. 
I, the other one I support is wood, the wood, Woodland Trust, which supports the growing of trees all over this country, which they're doing by millions of trees. You just wouldn't believe what they're doing. They're quiet about it. They don't, don't talk about it a lot, but look up Woodland Trust. You see, there's another example of taking advantage of interdependence. They plant one tree. I don't think it, it doesn't make a difference. It does make a difference. If everybody plants one tree around the world, that would be 8 billion trees. That would solve a lot of problems that we have with the atmosphere at the moment. So let's undermine or turn away from harmful interdependence. Because think of the system, the economic system we have, and how interdependent it has become. It's become a network so tightly pulled together that it can last for decades. And only something like a pandemic can show its weakness. We have an economic system in which manufacturing, consumption, the disposal of wastage, uh, the use of various products, advertising, our values, what's important, all of that has become one self-destructive interdependent system. Let's snap out of it. But don't say to yourself, I can't make any difference. Yes, you can. So start, start today. If you haven't started, I'm sure many of you belong to NGOs. We just need to do more of that because that is where good inter interdependence comes in. The world can be changed. Now, when the world is not changing in a fruitful direction, it tends to become self-destructive um, and we tend to become afraid. Then we withdraw into what we're familiar with, make America great again, make England great again. Um, all our little fantasies about protecting ourselves which actually only makes matters worse. So we need to have the confidence to go forth um, and create new links, new, new, new um, concatenations, if you like big words, uh, connections between things which are an alternative to the mess we have at the moment. Think of every product that you touch, the products around you at the moment. You're sitting on chairs. You have bookshelves behind you, you have books, you have um, a teapot or a cup or a mobile phone waiting to be used. Every single one of these is not as independent as it looks. It has a life. Take a mobile phone. Where did it come from? How was it made? What's in it? What human labor had to go into it? What resources had to go into it? And how did it get to be that shiny, beautiful little thing in your hand? And what happens then? It starts to get old, starts to break down. Okay, we'll shove it in the bottom drawer. Or we may take it back to, to a shop. But you see, the point is, it's our mentality that's important. We haven't really thought about where it comes from. I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes from hard cheap labor in the Congo and other countries where you can find the precious metals that you've never even heard of like niobium and tantalum they're in your mobile phone you've never heard about them you have no connection directly with them and yet the mobile phone doesn't work without those things and it doesn't work without the labor the cheap labor exploit of exploited African people in the Congo as a connection because we don't see the products life as a life cycle we see it as a finished product in a nice shiny box. Now, when it starts breaking down, we don't think about that too much. We might think, well, what should I really do with this? But, you know, I could think of many examples in my own family and, and me too. I have too much, too much electronic junk around me. I don't know where it's going. I don't know, I'm not sure how to dispose of it. But we see what's happening with plastics in the oceans. Just take the, the issue of plastics. In, in, in both the Atlantic and the Pacific, there are things called vortices. That's a vortex rotating round and round, absolutely jam-packed with plastic, destroying plankton, 
And plankton, by the way, are absolutely vital again to our existence because plankton produce our oxygen and take up the carbon dioxide. Plankton, the most humble little creature, we depend on it. There's interdependence for you. And yet we don't know of it. And if we do know of it, we don't care very much. Because I'm not going to fall into a vortex of used plastic, am I? You know, I'm going to go home and uh, put my feet up. And yet one day that vortex of plastic will come home and hit us because it's killing the fish, it's killing the plankton, and we ultimately dependent, uh, are dependent, interdependent on those things. So we have to think interdependence. Think of what goes into manufacturing the thing. The resources, the labor, etc., etc. It's enormous. But we go to a showroom for a car and we look at the car and we think, I really want that car. We don't think about all the metals and plastics and the ingenuity, the way that intelligent people have been kidnapped to, to, to design things which feed into our, our greed for more consumption. You know, th this obviously can't go on in this way, can it? We need a, we need a change in the way of thinking. So there's, there's the principle in general. There's interdependence in general. But so we are talking about the outside world. But actually, as the Buddha teaches us, there is no outside world which is separate from this inside or inner world of mind. They're, inter they're also interconnected, actually boil down to very much the same thing. So what is, the, what is the, the Buddhist principle here? Well, in Buddhism, it's generally called dependent origination. That, that is that all things originate or, cre uh, or, or give, are given rise to, arise, through the coming together of a host of different conditions. Okay, good place to start. Think of yourself in this respect. If you just think, look into yourself, think, this is me. How did I come to be here? I'm not talking about my body. I'm not talking about biology. Why me? Why John or Mark or Mike or Susan or Anne or Jeff or... How did I get to be here? I don't know. Well, I can tell you one thing, that an infinite number of conditions have to come together for this me to arise, and that applies not just to me, obviously, to all of you. We need to look at it that way. It is totally astounding and amazing that any one me is here looking out on the world. But what we don't see is dependent origination, that my origins lie in dependence on countless conditions coming together. We talked the other day about infinite, infinity. Well, an infinite, uncountable, immeasurable number of, 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 of conditions have to come together for me to exist. I'm not talking about just my body. I'm talking about this me that is speaking or thinking or listening at the moment. So dependent origination is the, is the term you'll come across in Buddhist circles. And here, the focus is more now on my mind. So it's now thinking of my mind and my actions and my motives in terms of their interconnection. Now remember, the Buddha is trying to help us out here. He says, if you understand this deeply, you become a very wise person. You're able to change some of the conditions that are that are giving rise to the me that I am. An unhappy me, perhaps, with bad memories, thoughts, anger, etc., etc. Well, it's all, that's all part of the interdependent network. Now, what if I can actually see those conditions arising? The conditions that are helpful for me, my happiness, if you like, and my fruitfulness, and also the ones which are dysfunctional, which are causing my unhappiness. What if I could see those conditions and the interconnections arising? Well, first of all, I have to acknowledge them. And then I have to work with them. I have to some, find some way of subduing the, the harmful ones. 
I have to find a way of cultivating the good ones. This is what the Buddha calls right effort, of course, which I've spoken about many times before. So here the, the idea is that if a certain action is taken or if a certain thought occurs to you or a certain volition, a wanting of something occurs to you, it will, it will give rise to something else which may not be good. I, I, could, I could go on with my life like that, it just, you know, without any, if you like, self-control. On the other hand, I could get to understand how this, how this happens. If this exists, then that exists. If that exists, then this exists. This is what the Buddha actually says. Now, there's a classical presentation of this core of dependent origination. Uh, which I find rather artificial, but it tries to put together a certain number of important factors and to show how they're interlinked. So let's just, just take a little example of this in the time we've got left. Our senses, our, our sight, smell, touch, etc., etc. What do they give rise to? They give rise to contact. We have no contact with anything without the senses. So there's dependent origination for you already. The senses give rise to contact. What does contact give a rise to? It gives a rise to feelings or impressions. So once I see something, then I have an impression of it. Once I have an impression of it, I might crave for it, I might want it. On the other hand, I might be afraid of it or reject it. So I might reject or I might want. If I crave, then the craving gives a rise to clinging. I will cling to it, I will hold on to it. It becomes mine. What is this mine? Where is this mine? What is this mine? What does it look like? There is no mine except in my head. And it's, orig it's originated from conditions that have gone beforehand. So we see that that craving gives a rise to clinging, which gives a rise to attaching, which gives a rise to suffering. You could think of it as, you know, buying a car. If I hadn't seen the car in the showroom, I probably wouldn't have thought of buying it, but I saw it, that's my senses of work. And then we start this whole rigmarole until I want it, and when I got it, it's mine. When it's mine, I've got to protect it, etc., etc. So now the Buddha, what the Buddha is interested in is this interconnection of thoughts, feelings, volitions in our minds, intimately connected with what's going on around us. Because I can think you can see the connection between our consumption and what that's doing economically and environmentally, and what our feelings are about consuming more and more, interconnected. If I didn't want to consume anymore, if I didn't know what a car was, if I was living in the Amazonian jungle with a tribal society and probably quite happy, I wouldn't even know what a car was. I wouldn't know what a watch was. So I couldn't possibly crave for it. The condition has to be there to give rise to that craving. Okay, so in Vipassana uh, practice, which is basically what we're trying to do, maybe in our clumsy way sometimes, in, in New Buddha way, is to become aware of that chain of conditions and intervene in it, basically. But once we've seen it, we can intervene in it. So first of all, we have to see the preconditions of things in that chain of factors. Then we can think about how to break that chain when it's resulting in, in, in damage or harm, by letting go of the preconditions. Give a simple example. Say I'm a smoker, I'm addicted to, 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 to tobacco. Okay, there's a craving. When I don't get it, then I, then I crave for it. Now it's well known that if you have a craving for alcohol or cigarettes or cocaine or whatever, don't go there. Don't go into a pub. 
don't go where people are smoking because that's immediately going to trigger off the whole chain. And so letting go of certain preconditions is quite important. We've got to know what those preconditions, we've got to recognize them. We've got to know our own minds and how our minds are working. We've got to see it, not just clamber about through life without any recognition of how my mind is actually working that I can become aware of, that I can self-reflect on. Then the opposite we can do is to support the chain where the chain is a good thing. Providing conditions, strengthening their conditions. For example, we do that in Metta Bhavana practice. When we chant good thoughts, we start to feel good about it. Not, not all that surprising really, is it? But we need to do it. We need to have confidence that it works. So now we're changing the whole balance of the network of conditions such that we're moving to being more wise, more peaceful, more supportive of community and society. Okay, so the message to take away, I think uh, we've run out of time. The key point for your life about all this chatter about dependence arising, etc., is this, understand how the network of your bodily, mental actions and non-actions support the helpful or harmful in your following the path to peace and wisdom. That is, what you, that is what we're doing here. That is the nub of what we're doing here. What we're doing here is learning to look in our own minds and recognize those chunks of parts or factors within the network of conditions of our actions and thoughts, which are harmful and those which are not, and do something about it. So I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. New Buddha Way lets go of East and West and starts afresh in the life we have now. For more information, visit www.newbuddhaway.org